Welcome to class uh, in the Book of Romans, a study on the Book of Romans. Uh, thank you, John Paul, Rosalind Zelotoli, and Jeffina for joining class. Um, we began studying uh, Romans chapter 11 on Monday. Uh, we studied right up to verse 6, so we'll, um, we'll study verses 7 onwards of Romans chapter 11. Before we do that, can uh, we just pause for a word of prayer? Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone would like to lead us in prayer? Father, we uh, pray this morning that you would speak to us, help us to know your word, help us to understand it clearly, and help us to apply this in our lives. We pray for this time of learning that you would enable each one of us to listen and to follow. We give you praise in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. So in chapter 11, um, we're basically uh, looking at, uh, you know, uh, we looked at verses 1 to 6. Uh, in this chapter, Paul is revealing to us, uh, Apostle Paul is revealing God's plan for Israel. He's showing us of God's plan of sharing the gospel to um, the Gentiles uh, comes as uh, a means to awaken uh, the Jews from their uh, slumber, uh, for them to, you know, awaken them uh, to also, you know, to respond to the uh, gospel. Okay, so uh, in verses one to six, which we studied on Monday, Paul is basically saying or telling. Um, uh, the Jews that God has not given up on the Jewish race or he's not given up on the people of Israel. Uh, yes, on a larger scale, they have rejected the gospel. Yet, you know, God has not given up on them. He's not forgotten them. Uh, and he says that, you know, among the Jews, there are a few who have said yes to uh, the grace of God that has been uh, released or given to them through Jesus Christ. And Paul says that he is one such person, uh, and there are others as well, a remnant of Jews who have responded to the grace of God. So that is what he is uh, mentioning in verses 1 to 6. Uh, we will look now verses 7 to verse 10. So can one of you please read verses 7 to 10, please? Anyone? Verses 7 to 10. Verse 7. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So Paul is saying that Israel um, as a nation, they haven't got what they are seeking because they are trying uh, to receive righteousness by the law. And he says that it's not going to work. He says, but the elect, that the chosen people, a few of them who said yes to the gospel, they have received the righteousness by faith. Okay. And then he says, what about the rest of the Jews? So he says the rest of the Jews, their eyes are blinded. And he quotes two passages from the Old Testament. Uh, in verse 8, Paul quotes from Isaiah chapter 29, verses 10 and 13, and Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 3 and 4. So he's talking of the fact that they have a spirit or stupor or um, slumber, okay? So they are asleep. A stupor means they are in a state like a dream or a coma or a daze. You know, uh, 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 or a slumber, they're fast asleep, blinded to the things 
that are happening around and binding to the truth. And he also quotes uh, David from Psalm 69, uh, verses 22 to verse 23 in verses 9 and 10. And he says that the rest of them uh, are blinded. He says, um, uh, you see here, he, he's, he says in verse 8, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that should not hear. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not that God has blinded them from understanding or receiving the gospel. Then uh, if God has not given them, where does this blindness come from? Or what is causing this blindness? Okay, so there can be two, two sources. One source is, you know, our own choosing to depart from the truth and choosing not to see the light, um, maybe for various reasons. Um, you know, uh, John, you know, when he wrote, he says, men love darkness rather than the light. So maybe they love the darkness than the light, or they're choosing to depart from the truth, and they choose not to see the truth for various reasons. Um, in our own disposition, we choose to go away from the truth, and that's when, you know, God gives us Okay, so he says, you know, you want to go that way. This is your choice. You want to make the choice. You want to go that way. He gives us up to what we uh, choose. Okay, and uh, so this is one source of blindness. The other source of blindness can be Satan, who blinds the minds of those who believe. Uh, you know, he puts a veil uh, of blindness on people. Okay, so when people, uh, sorry, when Paul is saying that God has given them a spirit of stupor, you know, uh, uh, would God be self contradictory? You know, would he on one hand say, I want you to accept and receive my son and the message of Christ, uh, or uh, as he declared in his words, that in his word, that you know, he wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So if he is giving them a spirit of stupor and slumber, and on the one hand, he wants them to accept and receive his son and the message of Jesus Christ. Then, you know, uh, saying that he has given them a spiritual stupor would actually work against himself because he himself is saying it and that he wants all men to be saved. Or he himself is saying that he wants everyone to accept and receive his son. And he himself is preventing people from receiving the message. Now, would he do that? Would he work against himself? No, definitely not. God cannot work against him. Um, self. So what does it mean when, uh, you know, it says here that God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. It should be understood in this, the light of uh, how we uh, understood what God spoke about Pharaoh in Romans chapter 9. Okay, When he said that God, when we read there that God hardened Pharaoh's Heart. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Or did God allow him to harden his own heart? God allowed him, Pharaoh, to harden his own heart. His heart was already hardened and he wanted to harden his heart against God and God allowed that. The same example of Judas. Now did God make Judas betray him? Or did he allow Judas to do what he decided to do or what he chose to do? So if God caused Judas to betray him, then Judas would have been a greater savior, right? Uh, so did God choose um, or did Judas choose what he did? It was Judas who chose what he did. And it was Judas's choice. And hence we read that he went and, you know, hung himself, okay? So God just allowed him to do what he wanted to do. God has given us the free will to choose. You know, gift of volition, and we just choose whatever we want to choose. And uh, God does. Uh, th th does it mean that God does not stop us? No, He does. He's given us our conscience. He's given us the Word. He's given us the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. All of uh, these things are different ways that He guides us and leads us. But you know, if we continue to hold on to our own ways and we want to make our own choices, then God gives us up to our own choice. He says, you want to go that way, go. You want to do that, you do it. You want to choose that, 
uh, you choose it okay so here in romans chapter 11 verse 8 we have to understand it in the same sense just like we read in romans chapter 1 verse 24 where it says god gave them up to their uncleanliness so god gave them up it was 26 of chapter 1 god gave them up to their own vile sinful passions or what we read in uh, romans chapter 1 verse 28 where it says god gave them over to a debased mind what why did God keep them over to a debased mind? Why did God keep them up to uncleanliness, to wild passions? Because after knowing the truth, no, they replaced the truth for a lie. They exchanged the glory of God for the glory of idols. Okay, and they also, um, uh, you know, creation itself. It says, and we studied at Romans chapter one. You know, reveals the Godhead, reveals the uh, the glory of God, and you know, the truth is out there, very evident. But you know, they did they did not choose the truth, and so it says, God gave them up to their uncleanliness, their vile passions, and to their debased mind. So why did God give them up? Because that is what they chose. Did what? Did God want this for them? No way, God did not want this for them. So the same way we need to interpret and we need to ask the question, has God given them a spirit of slumber and stupor? No. So what is the answer? They chose darkness, they chose to reject Christ, and they chose to go their own way. Okay. So what Paul is saying is Israel is not able to obtain righteousness by the way they want, but there are some who have obtained it by grace and the rest are in blindness and darkness and they are there because God has let them go their way or let them be or choose what they want to choose, okay? So that is um, verses uh, 7 to verse um, 11, uh, to verse 10, yeah, to verse 10. Anyone has any questions before we move on to verse 11? Okay, there are no questions. We'll move on to verse 11. Can somebody please read verses 11 to verse 15, please? Romans chapter 11, verses 11 to 15. Yes, Jafina, go ahead and read. Romans chapter 11, verses uh, 11 to 15. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy, those who are my flesh and save some of them for if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the word what will their acceptance be but life from the dead amen thank you jeffina so he says in verse 11 i say then have they stumbled that they should fall so he's asking a question similar to what he's asked in verse 1 has god cast away his people and the answer is no God has not cast them away because there are some people among them who have experienced Christ. So the next question is, he's saying, so have they fallen because they are in a state of blindness and they are in a place where they cannot be brought back? Have, because of that, have they fallen? So the answer is certainly not. Okay. The word fall means uh, have they trespassed? Have they gone out of the way okay so through their fall it's very clear that it is their fall and it is their trespass it's not god who has put them in blindness it's their blindness that has put them into trespass or it's their blindness that has uh, got them out of the way but through the trespass of the jews you know what has happened salvation has come to the who has it come to Salvation has come to whom? The Gentiles. And God is uh, going to provoke the Jews to 
jealousy. Okay, why provoke the Jews to jealousy? Because the Jews thought that the kingdom of God is for the Jews. You know, the messianic banquet is only for the Jews. There would be no Gentiles in it. And, uh, you know, so when the gospel is gone out to the, from the Jews to the um, Gentiles, and they are also part of the church, part of the kingdom of God, part of the Abrahamic uh, blessing, um, uh, you know, it's going to provoke them. It's going to awake them. It's going to uh, provoke them to jealousy. So he's Paul is saying that the Jews are in darkness and uh, sin, but God is going to use the salvation of the Gentiles to awaken them and get them back. And he's just provoking them so that they can come and they can receive salvation. Okay. Verse 12, the following, the falling away of the Jews has brought, you know, so much uh, benefit for the Gentiles. Um, and uh, just the failure of the Jews to uh, receive the Messiah, uh, you know, has brought so much of richness and blessing and inheritance to the Gentiles. And uh, so Paul is saying, what do you think will happen if only the Jews, you know, they fall in line and if only the Jews, you know, um, um, uh, accept Christ accept uh, the grace of God and salvation by faith, you know, he's saying, just imagine how much more the Gentiles will be blessed. Just by the following, falling away, just by the rebellious nature, just by the rejection of the Jews, the Gentiles have received so much of rich, riches and blessings. You know, what will happen if uh, the Jews fall in line? How much more the Gentiles will be blessed? And then he says, even though he's an apostle to the Gentiles, what he really likes to do is by reaching out to the Gentiles, by preaching to the Gentiles, and you know, thus fulfilling his call that God has for his life, you know, uh, by preaching the gospel of salvation to the Gentiles, um, and by them being saved, he's saying, you know, my ministry is somehow provoking the Jews to jealousy so they too can be saved. So he's saying that, you know, indirectly his ministry to the Gentiles is going to be an added benefit because when he's preaching to the Gentiles and they're going to be saved and they're going to receive salvation, the Jews are going to get J, okay, they're going to get jealous, and so they too can be, um, and then they get jealous, they're provoked, they, you know, they awaken from their slumber, somehow they will be uh, saved. So we can see um, Paul's deep down passion, uh, his desire for his people to be saved, even as he's called to be an apostle among the uh, Gentiles, okay? Verse 15. For if their being cast away is reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Okay, so saying if the Jews come to the to a faith, a great and a grand resurrection is going to take place. It's act, it's like you know people coming back from the uh, dead. Okay, and. Um, you know, some commentators refer this to the prophetic event where uh, the Jews will accept the Messiah as a whole and God will establish the millennium kingdom. Uh, this event of restoring Israel can be, you know, can be uh, compared to this phrase, uh, you know, giving, uh, bringing uh, life from the uh, dead. And also some commentary writers say that Israel's acceptance will be life from the dead, that is, like the first resurrection, okay? The first resurrection includes saints at the rapture, those, uh, you know, saints who had uh, gone through tribulation, you know, they uh, their resurrection. So he's saying it would be like that. So he's saying, just imagine, you know, uh, uh, just by them be casting away or being cast away uh, is reconciling the world, is bringing the world back to God, what will be uh, the situation if the Jews accept the gospel, they accept the salvation that is through Jesus Christ, you know, it'll be as just say people are coming back from life to, uh, uh, from the dead, okay? So just summing up what was said so far, you know, God has not given up on the Jews, 
uh, he has uh, they, uh, the Jews have chosen darkness, you know, um, and hence because they chose darkness, salvation was given to the Gentiles. And it was given to the Gentiles also as a way to provoke the Jews to jealousy. So if the Jews' rejection and their darkness uh, or the rejection of the gospel, you know, brought salvation and blessing to the Gentiles, how much more will the Gentiles receive blessings if the Jews receive the gospel or become righteous by faith through grace? Okay. So that is what he's mentioning in um, uh, these verses, verses 11 to verse 15. Okay, We'll move on to verses 16 to verse um, 25. Before that, anyone has any questions? Verses 16 to 25, anyone has any questions? OK, if there are no questions, can somebody Please read um, Romans chapter 11, verses 16 to 25, please. Verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut, cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Amen. But for, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles Gentiles has come in. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So this is very, very interesting here how Paul uh, presents uh, this truth to us. He's basically painting a very beautiful picture of the olive tree. And what he presents to us is this. He says, imagine two olive trees. One is a cultivated olive tree, you know, in a cultivated land where it's taken care of. And it's a, there's another olive tree, and that olive tree is a wild olive tree, which is growing in the wild. Okay? But the cultivated olive tree represents, who does it represent? The Jews, the Israelites. And says some did not believe, and so God cuts them off, and he takes them off as branches, you know, from the tree. And um, he takes the branches of the wild olive tree, which are the Gentiles, who believe in Jesus Christ, to believe the salvation that is in Jesus Christ, and he grafts them into the cultivated olive tree and he makes them part of what he is doing so he tells the gentiles you know now those of you who are grafted into this cultivated olive tree you know don't boast don't boast because you have been grafted but remember that this tree is standing there because of its roots 
which tree is he talking about? The main cultivated olive tree, uh, in which the wild olive tree branches have been grafted. Okay, so he says, don't telling the Gentiles, don't boast, because this tree is standing there because of its roots. And the roots, he's basically talking about the origin. And who's the origin? They are the Jews. Okay, it started with Abraham. So he said, don't boast that you are superior to the Jews. You have been grafted in by faith, so don't be proud. Okay. And then in verse 22, he says, there is both the goodness of God and the severity of God. So he's a God of truth and he's also a God of justice. Okay. God is good to those who respond to him in faith. But those who do not respond to him or do not believe, he has to deal with it, them in severity. So we already uh, studied this, right? In the in the preceding chapters, we studied about this. How you know uh, there are some vessels for wrath and some vessels for um, the grace, the goodness, the glory of God. And it's not that the vessels of wrath were predestined, you know, and God is waiting to. Put them as vessels of wrath, but now we all we said that you know he has he's patient, he's long suffering, he's waiting for them to change. But if they don't change, they make a willing choice not to change, then there is nothing else that God can do in spite of his patience and his long suffering. They will end up to be vessels of the wrath of God. Okay, so um he's saying that you know God is just this God of truth and the God of severity or god of uh, goodness and god of severity god of truth and god of justice and he's saying those who respond to in faith and uh, you know he shows his goodness and those who do not uh, respond in faith he deals with them very very uh, severely so even among the jews you know god is able to bring them in and graft them back into that cultivated olive tree uh, if they respond in faith and they don't continue in unbelief. Now Paul says in verse 24, think about how God is grafting the branches of the wild olive tree into the main olive tree, the cultivated um, olive tree. That's what he says in 24. If, if you were cut, out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, where grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches? Natural branches means he's talking about the Jews who were cut off, now be grafted into their own olive tree. When God has been so gracious, so merciful, he will be gracious and merciful to the Jews, he will also, you know, bring them back, he will also graft them into the main olive uh, tree, okay? Verse 25, um, you know, he says, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Okay, so he's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, which means God is revealing a secret, he's revealing the plan of God on the earth. This is what he is doing. You know, what is he doing? God is bringing in the branches of the wild olive trees into the main olive tree, and he is bringing them part of his original plan. Um, and um, he is doing this. You know, and he's doing this because uh, why? Because look at what it says, you know, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, which means God has allowed Israel to be in the state of blindness. Um, allowed again, we we not say that God is okay doing this so that the Gentiles can be brought in and grafted. No, it's not that he can't graft both of them or he can't graft the, uh, you know, the, the branches of uh, the, the wild olive trees, not that. It's, he's allowed it because they want it that way. The Israelites, the Jews want it that way. So he says, God has allowed Israel to be in a state of blindness until the Gentiles are brought in and grafted in. And then God is going to wrap this up by awakening the 
Jews, which means God is saying, hey, you Jews, God has not forgotten you. He still has a plan and purpose. He is going to work uh, among you. He is going to bring you back and he's going to uh, graft you into back into the uh, main olive tree. And so this is what God is doing on the earth right now. God is allowing all peoples of the earth to come in and be part of his plan. He's gathering them in and then he will also go after the Israelites. He will also go after the Jewish uh, race, the Jewish nation. Okay. We look at verses 26 to 36. Uh, any questions before that? No questions? Okay, there are no questions. We can read verses 26 to verse 36, please. Can somebody read that? Anyone would like to read it? And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For us, you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Yes, go ahead, Lyndon. You can read till verse 36, please. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lyndon. So here, um, Paul brings this sec section uh, to a conclusion. Is to saying that all Israel will be saved. When he says all Israel does not mean every individual, but you know that salvation will touch everyone powerfully and those who believe will be um, saved. And he says, as, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So he's basically quoting from Isaiah, Chapter 59, verses 20 to 21, where it says, The Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forever. No. So he's basically quoting uh, from Isaiah 59, verse 20 to 21, that, you know, God would keep his covenant with them and, you know, um, uh, you know, he would put his words in their mouth and, um, you know, they will not depart from the words that he puts in their mouth, neither their descendants or their descendants' descendants. Okay. So that is talking about how Israel will be saved. Verse 28, he says, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the Father. So Paul is telling the Gentiles right now, as far as the gospel is concerned, you know, uh, the Jews may be their enemies. Uh, you know, it seemed like in the days uh, uh, Paul's days that the Jews were enemies of God because they were against Jesus. Okay, but concerning God's choosing, he said they are beloved of God. 
you know, uh, if for no other reason than for the sake of their fathers, that is the patriarchs of the Old Testament, you know, so as far as God's purpose, election, and calling and choosing is concerned, you know, they are the root. And so he's saying, you know, if not even for their own blindness, for their stubbornness, their hardness of heart, but for the sake of the forefathers, the patriarchs, the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, you know, he's saying, you know, for that reason, at least God is concerned about the Jews and he would bring them uh, back. So, you know, he's... Uh, so as far as the purpose, election, and choosing is concerned, you know, they are the root and they are the main cultivated tree through which God is working out his plan and purpose. So there is hope for the Jews. That's what Paul is saying, that God has not forgotten about them. Okay. Verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Okay. God does not his change his mind regarding his calling, his gifting, his choosing, and his purpose. Okay, uh, Isn't that wonderful? Like even though the Jews rejected him, even though the Jews uh, crucified his son, they did not believe, they went away, even though they had all of the laws, the covenants, the rituals, the sacrifices, everything that pointed to the Messiah, yet they failed to recognize him as a Messiah. But in spite of that, God has not forgotten his calling, his choosing, and his purpose that he promised through his covenants that he's given to the four uh, fathers. Okay, So we see how uh, true to his covenant, to his promise, to his word he makes even to man that God is faithful in keeping it because he is God. If he ceases to not be true to his words, he ceases to be uh, God. So when God calls uh, us or when God calls someone, he does not change his mind. Okay, That's something that even we need to keep uh, you know, in our minds, that when God has called us, when he's called you, he's called me, he's chosen you, he's chosen me, he's not going to change his mind. He's not going to cast us away. He's not going to abandon us. He's not uh, going to give up on us, even though we give up, even though we fall away, even though we, um, you know, go away from his purposes, but he's still going to work out and fulfill his uh, plan and his purpose uh, for our lives when we come back, when we, um, you know, uh, uh, realize what we have done and we come back, he's going to continue to fulfill his uh, calling, his gifting, his choosing and his purpose that he has on our lives. And this is a wonderful assurance that we have that we can receive you know, uh, from uh, Romans chapter 11. And then Paul uh, sums up by saying, you know, hey, think about this. You know, verse 34, as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mercy through their disobedience. Excuse me. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. So here it says, you were once disobedient to God. So he's telling the Gentile Christians that, you know, hey, you also came from disobedience. You were also rebellious, stubborn, you know, you were disobedient. And he says, yet hey, God showed you mercy and, um, and he showed the Jews also mercy in part through the disobedience of Israel. So through the disobedience of Israel, God has shown you Gentiles mercy by bringing the gospel uh, to each one of you. And he says that you have obtained mercy through their uh, disobedience. So it says if God used the disobedience of Israel for the good of the Gentiles, you know, which means the Jews refuse to accept the truth that is in Jesus Christ, and now the truth is taken to the Gentiles. If God can use this, that, you know, the Jews refuse to accept the truth and because of which he's taken the truth to the Gentiles, and he can also use the mercy shown to the Gentiles for the mercy that he will show to the Israelites. Okay, So 
that's what he's saying. You know, when God can use disobedience of Israelites to show mercy to the uh, Gentiles, God can also use the mercy that he's shown the Gentiles to show mercy to the uh, Jewish people, to the Israelites. And then he says, God has committed them all to disobedience. The idea is that the Jews and Gentiles are all lawbreakers. They were all disobedient at God's sight. But God, in his mercy, God offers his mercy to them. And based on the person and work of Christ, you know, they receive his mercy and grace. And they are part of the main olive tree. Okay. So in verses 32 to 36, Paul is basically celebrating this mystery that is being revealed. And what is the mystery? The mystery is in, uh, mentioned in verse 25 of the same chapter, Romans chapter 11. It says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So he's celebrating the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How wonderful is God in his working, you know, that even though the Jews have rejected and been stubborn, you know, it has, the, the, the message of salvation has gone to the Gentiles, they've been grafted into the main tree, but God has um, just has shown mercy to the Gentiles, he's also going to show mercy uh, to the Israelites, he's going to bring them back, he's going to graft them into the main altar tree. So he's just celebrating. The, the, the wisdom, the knowledge, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God, how wonderful is the way he works. And um, that when, you know, this is God at work and his ways are unsearchable. And it's, it's something that is, you know, uncomprehensible that we can't comprehend. It's way beyond our understanding, okay? So what God is doing to the nations is actually all coming together to fulfill his plan and his uh, purposes, which uh, is for the Gentiles and the Jews both to experience the mercy of God. Okay. So in verses 34 and 35, he's basically quoting from the Old Testament, that is, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13, and Job chapter 41, verse um, 11. So the last few verses, 34 to 36, he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor? Verse 35, or who has was given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? Verse 36, for of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. So Paul is saying, it is all of him, which means... This plan came from God, okay? It wasn't man's idea. We didn't say, you know, I've offended God and have to find a way back to him. So let's work on a plan to come back to God, okay? In our spiritual uh, indifference and, you know, we were so dead to the things of God, uh, we were so alive to sin, we didn't even care about a plan and we you know even if we did think of a plan we were not smart enough or wise enough as god uh, you know to make a plan a, a wise plan uh, uh, to you know how we can bail ourselves out or get ourselves out from this net or the mighty pit or the darkness that we were in it's all of him it was all him who did it was his plan his wisdom his knowledge and it was not our plan. And then he says, it is all through him, okay? Um, it's all of him, we saw that. It's all through him. It says, even if we had a plan, you know, we couldn't make it happen, okay? We wouldn't be able to free ourselves from this, this prison of sin and self. It could only happen through him, through Christ. And the great work of Jesus on our behalf, it is through him that we receive salvation by grace through faith. Okay, So that is all through him. And it says it's all to him. Okay, So we saw all of him, through him, and it says to him are all things. So it's not 
for me, it's not for you, it's all to him. Okay, the praise, the glory um, of his grace is all goes back to him. It is for his pleasure that we are created and we find our fulfillment in bringing him all the glory and honor. And then he ends by saying, to whom be the glory forever. Uh, the fact that Paul can't figure out, you know, uh, God makes him glorify. You know, the, the, the point that, you know, he's saying here is that he can't uh, just figure out, you know, how we could even get ourselves out of our sin and all of these things. But how wonderful is God's plan? Um, how wonderful is his purposes, his, uh, his ideas, his election, his choices, how he's bringing all of it together. He's saying, you know, it is just so wonderful. It is way beyond our understanding and comprehension. But he says, you know, uh, God is doing it and it's all glory uh, to him. So all the more when we understand the greatness of God, you know, uh, uh, or when we're looking at his wisdom, his uh, uh, his ways, his purposes, his plans, and how he's fulfilling it, you know, we just uh, understand some, the little bit of the greatness of God, and, uh, you know, it leads us to worship him more passionately, it leads us to just glorify him and give him all the glory and the honor, okay? So that is what he's saying. He's saying, you know, this is standing in awe of God's plan and purposes, that how he brings the Gentiles uh, into his kingdom and how he's using what he's doing among the Gentiles to stir up the Jews, you know, so that they can also receive salvation. And just as he showed mercy to the Gentiles, he will show mercy to the uh, Jews um, because the calling of God is irrevocable. That means the plans, the purposes, the election, everything that he had, you know, uh, he is going to fulfill uh, that. He is going to bring that into fulfillment and to uh, completion. Okay. So that is Romans chapter 11. Any questions? Any questions? So we see that uh, because of Abraham, he, he was a great work of the Lord. And so does it give us a guarantee that, like for our generations, that like how because of Abraham believed and because of uh, all those things that you think, uh, the calling, the election of God has been fulfilled because of the root that is the forefathers. Yeah. So, so because of us, will our generations also have that kind of case? I'm just asking, is it a guarantee in that way? Or is oh, no, no, no. Not because of uh, our generation, but it's why is he talking about the forefathers? Because the covenant he has made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But our generations to come will stand on the covenant that the new covenant that is made by the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's important that you know each generation builds on the, the faith of the previous generation where they have left and uh, impart uh, what they the, the truths, the revelations of faith, what we have received in our generation, impart it to the next generation. So the next generation builds on from. That is important for us to do. Yes. Okay, um, no questions. If there are no questions, uh, thank you all for joining class. I posted the assessment last evening uh, on Romans chapter 5 to chapter 8. And your assessment is due tomorrow. Oh, today? No. Tomorrow, right? Tomorrow evening. It's two days. Today is the um, you posted it day before yesterday. Oh, day before yesterday? Yeah. Oh, yeah, day before yesterday. So today is the, the sun. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, all of you have a blessed uh, weekend. God bless you. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you, everyone.